Now, it is my uh, great honor uh, to introduce uh, Valerie B. Jarrett, who will moderate our first panel. Uh, Valerie Jarrett is a distinguished senior fellow at the University of Chicago Law School, and she has a list of accomplishments and honors that I can hardly do justice to in this brief uh, introduction. Uh, Ms. Jarrett was the longest serving senior advisor to President Barack Obama. She oversaw the offices of public engagement and intergovernmental affairs and chaired the White House Council on Women and Girls. She has served as the chief executive officer of the Habitat Company in Chicago, chairman of the Chicago Transit Board, commissioner of planning and development, and deputy chief of staff for Chicago Mayor uh, Richard M. Daly. She has also served as the director of numerous corporate and not-for-profit boards, including chairman of the board of the Chicago Stock Exchange, chairman of the University of Chicago Medical Center Board of Trustees, director of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, and she has received numerous awards and honorary degrees, including Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. She currently serves on the boards of Ariel Capital Management Holdings, 2U and Lyft, and is a senior advisor to the Obama Foundation. She's a graduate of Stanford University and of Michigan, University of Michigan Law School. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Jarrett, for joining us today. I will now turn things over to you. Thank you so much and good afternoon, everyone. I have been looking forward to this event literally for months since it was first mentioned to me and I couldn't be more delighted that I'm here and able to host. We're running a little bit ahead of schedule. And so I see one of my panelists on. I'm gonna introduce them all to you. And when they arrive, we will bring them into the conversation. One of the reasons why this is such a, such a special moment for me is because I've known Earl, or as I called him, Uncle Earl, for my entire life. And one of the panelists, who happens to be my mom, is going to explain to you a little bit of the background about why that happened. Um, but let me go through our list, and I'm going to go in order of seniority. So our first panelist is Tim Black. So Tim Black, I've also known my entire life, a historian, a social worker, the co-author of Sacred Ground, The Chicago Streets of Timuel Black. Uh, just an extraordinary icon, not just in Chicago, but around the entire country. Tim, if you are on, please come off mute and let me know that you're there. Tim will be with us in a minute. Second up, who I know is on, is my mom, Barbara Bowman. Barbara Bowman is the Irving B. Harris Professor of Child Development and co-founder of Erickson Institute, where she's still at the age of, sorry, mom, 92, um, continues to teach today. Tim, I just saw you on, so Tim is with us as well. Um, and then next is Steve Saltzman. Steve, are you with us yet? Yes. Great, oh, we're good, we're all here. I like people who are right on time. Steve, who I've known the least length of time for all of our panelists, I've known for 35 years. The reason why I know it's 35 years is that our daughters were born within months of each other and I can at least keep up with how old she is. Steve is with the law offices of Steve Saltzman and has been for a very long time one of the iconic leaders of the National Lawyers Guild of Chicago. And then finally, last but obviously not least, is Earl Dickinson's um, grandson, uh, Steve Brown, or as I call him, Stevie, um, I most vividly recall at his sixth birthday party where we were out in a huge field and I was trying to hold an egg on a spoon. And that's my first memory of Steve. But he and his siblings and his uh, family and extended family have been linked to my family for generations. And so welcome all of my panelists. I'm just delighted to see you here. So I think we're going to go in order again in terms of seniority and start with uh, Tim Black. So Tim, obviously you knew Earl Dickerson well, you appreciate the role he played in the history of our city. And so I wanna begin if you would just tell your story about how you came to know Earl Dickerson and what your impressions of him were then uh, as well as through his, the course of his life. Well, very, you honor me and thank you for this opportunity. 
I grew up in Chicago on the south side and knew your part of your family as we were concentrated. All the talent that existed was in what Robert Abbott called the Black Belt. Now, I don't want to take a good part of time because you have so many important people with details. The stories that I've listened to are very accurate and inspirational. And I see and remember Earl B. Dickerson as a model of overcoming the difficulties of separation and having the optimism and the devotion to encourage others while he worked with Mr. Hansberry and others like that, including the lead hair wife, to break that and have the preparation that legally the University of Chicago, I'm a graduate of the university also, not the law school, but other, that, that status, that experience made it a stimulation for younger people across race lines to believe that the impossible was always possible. And of course he carried that message across the country and inspired other people like members of your family and, and my family, in fact, to carry on that and make this world a better place for all people, but have the qualifications, the legal qualifications that no one could dispute the fact that you had accomplished what you wanted them also to accomplish. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Tim. Mom, you're up next in order of seniority, sorry. Uh, Steve's cheering you on here. So obviously, uh, as you will tell, Earl was very close to our family. So perhaps going back to your childhood, why don't you give your early impressions of him, uh, how he came to know um, you, your parents, uh, the relationship, his wife, uh, my godmother, Aunt Catherine, had with your mom. Give us a little bit of uh, personal context. Well, I knew Earl all my life, needless to say. Uh, I don't know how he got to know the family. I do know that he spent some time at Tuskegee. And it may be that when he was teaching at Tuskegee, he knew my grandfather. And my father was also um, there. And so he may have known both of them at Tuskegee. But uh, certainly, uh, they were well known by the time uh, I was born. Uh, actually, and Catherine and Uncle Earl lived in the same building we lived in. My earliest memory of him, I must have been three or four, and uh, spent the night with them. And uh, evidently, my parents were picking me up quite late. And when they arrived, I was in the bed with Uncle Earl eating a great big bowl of ice cream. And his explanation of why I was up so late and the twinkle in his eye was something that I always remembered about Uncle Earl. My next most vivid memory of him was, uh, I must've been about 10 and he was running for Alderman or some one of the uh, jobs that he was running for. And I got put in charge of sealing uh, envelopes. And nobody told me I could use a sponge or a wet napkin. So I was licking these envelopes and of course, he meant eventually became sick to the stomach. And Uncle Earl came and said, thank you, thank you, thank you for being so conscientious that you got sick. And I remember the gratitude that he showed, not just me, but all the other people who were campaign workers and trying to help him get elected. Um, so our families were meshed together through the years, as Valerie pointed out. Uh, uh, Aunt Catherine was her godmother, uh, was Laura's godmother, and my mother was Diane's godmother. Uh, 
So we had long time relationships with each other. Uh, um, well, did you ask me another question? <laughs> well, we'll pause there and we'll come back. But just for the record, he was my godmother. Not he was Laura. your godmother, yes. not Laura's. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Laura's I get my daughter. Up occasionally. <laughs> uh, we'll come, we're going to come back because I'm going to ask you a little bit more about your memories of him um, may, as an adult. May I just but, also uh, add that uh, I haven't seen Stephen for a while, but he is the slip image of every brown I ever knew. Uh, <laughs> and I've known his family all of their life. I've known him all of his life. <laughs> and also his father's side of the family. And his father before him. <laughs> exactly. Um, all right, well, before we get to Steve Brown, uh, Steve, so you're kind of like the odd man out because you're not family in this, but you certainly have a very keen appreciation of Earl Dickerson. So give us your story about um, Earl Dickerson. Well, if I may, let me start out by just talking about the Lawyers Guild because I want to talk Please. about him in the, in the Guild. In 1937, a group of lawyers decided they wanted to create and belong to a progressive bar association that had multiracial membership. The ABA remained segregated or remained white only until after Brown versus Board. They also wanted to have an organization that supported the activist labor movement, certainly focused on the Congress of Industrial Organization unions like the UAW and the Steelworkers. And they also wanted to belong to an organization that fought for, supported, and encouraged the New Deal. In the preamble to the to its constitution in 1937, the new NLG said it wanted, quote, to function as a social force of the people to the end that human rights shall be regarded as more sacred than property rights. Earl B. joined, Earl B. Dickerson joined and became active in the guild shortly after it was founded. In 1950, the House on American Activities Committee, HUAC, with the aid of FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, put out a report called the National Lawyers Guild, Legal Bulwark of the Communist Party. That began a reign of terror for the, the NLG and progressive left that we now call McCarthyism. Many progressive people lost their jobs and or were sent to jail. In 1951, Earl B. Dickerson became president of the National Lawyers Guild and remained as president until October of 1954. Here is a photograph of, at, in 19, at, the 1954, at the 1954 NLG convention at the Congress Hotel in Chicago of Earl B. and Paul Robeson. More about that later. Earl B. served as NLG president while the guild membership was being decimated. Think about that. Who would have done that and put themselves on the line like that? During that time, Hoover and Congress and, and and HUAC were trying to have the Guild listed as a subversive activities organization. But thanks to the courageous and sophisticated work of Earl B. Dickerson and, and other Guild stalwarts, Hoover failed. The Guild went on to do spectacular work in many other ways, including during Mississippi Freedom Summer in 1964, which reinvigorated the organization. I could stop there. I, I, the next thing I, I'll want to talk about is uh, uh, my, my meeting Earl B. in the 1980s and him being at a, at a guild convention with Harold Washington, but I, I, I can wait to do that. All right, we're gonna come back around on that. So now, Steve Brown, that is, um, give us your first impressions of your grandfather. I wouldn't even know where to begin to peg that. It was a, I, I actually grew up in the Dickerson household. Uh, my parents had split and divorced very early on. And uh, through circumstance, my mom was ill and my dad had gone into the army. I was living with uh, Earl and Catherine. Um, so my earliest recollections were of the fabulous apartment that uh, they had there on Drexel and Earl's presence between being a uh, high powered, just a whirlwind on multiple fronts that people have painted that have already articulating businessman still a little bit involved in the the law at the time but mostly he was a grandfather you know i knew him as just a little kid this was my grandfather who had a lot of books and always had time for me and treated me very much like an adult at a very young age it was very um interesting i'll put it that way and i, I know nothing else 
beyond that. That was uh, my relationship with Earl. I actually think I called him between, I fluctuated between Earl and Granddad. Um, and he was always there with time and amazement. I mean, the man's uh, mind was pretty spectacular. That's what I most remember. Well, I would say spectacular until the very end. I remember absolutely in um, 1983 going to a cousin's wedding at Rockefeller Chapel. And it was a very hot day. And um, I remember seeing Uncle Earl come out of the out of the chapel uh, with his cane in hand, um, if not 90, well, pretty darn close to it. And he was in lockstep with a young man who would later become my husband. And at first I was looking at the guy with Uncle Earl and then the two of them came over to me and we walked from Rockefeller Chapel down to the International House. And when that guy asked me on my first date, I said, well, where are we gonna go? And he said, well, Earl Dickerson has invited us over for dinner. And I thought, well, that's a rather curious first date, but I love Uncle Earl, so of course I'll go. And so we went over to his home for dinner and until 1.30 in the morning, the two of them debated about every possible issue. I could barely get an edge in um, otherwise. And at that point, which is probably hard for you all to believe, I was pretty shy, but he had every possible argument and angle and he really put Bobby through, um, through the, uh, the rigors, which made me think, okay, well, maybe this is a pretty smart guy after all, if you can go toe to toe with Uncle Earl. So I too experienced him as, you know, a close family friend. Remember being over at his home with Aunt Catherine when she was alive and they made scrambled eggs and sardines, which I had never had before. And to this day, I love scrambled eggs and sardines, not because it tastes that good, but because they put it together. Um, so, all right, so we're gonna go back and forth, personal and professional. And Steve Salzman, I want you to talk to this because you're the resident lawyer since I haven't practiced in a long while. But I think um, obviously Earl's um, extraordinary career, including practicing law, including arguing before the Supreme Court uh, is an important part of his legacy. And I, what I want the audience to appreciate is the um, transformational argument he made on restrictive covenants affecting the very neighborhood of Woodlawn adjacent to the University of Chicago. So would you give a brief Cliff Notes tutorial um, on the Hansberry case for the group? It'll be very brief. Uh, Mr. Hansberry bought a home in Woodlawn. There was a restrictive covenant. Uh, a lawsuit was filed to prevent him and the family from uh, being there. Uh, they fought back, went to the Supreme Court, and, and obtained an incredible decision that ultimately led to the Supreme Court some years later in, in holding that restrictive covenants were completely unlawful. So that case laid the groundwork for that. The interesting thing, other interesting thing about that case is uh, that, of course, as was said earlier, Mr. Hansberry had a daughter named Lorraine. She wrote a play called Raisin in the Sun. And I did a little research and Raisin in the Sun didn't just come out of her imagination. It came very much out of that lived experience. Thank you, Steve. So that case was decided in 1940. And so this question is for Tim and my mom. What memories do you have of that? Mom, you were obviously still in high school. Tim, not much further along. Mom, you weren't even in high school. Do you have memories of it? Do you, did you appreciate at the time, knowing him personally, the significance of that moment? Now let's start with you, Tim. Yes, I do. And I look at the history of Earl Dickinson with the, the details of being expressed on this conference as being inspirational educational and invigorating to younger people like I was then, I'm 102 now. But the struggle goes on, but Earl B. Dickerson was a model of having the accomplishment academically and otherwise, and yet feeling 
an obligation to others. And that's the message which I gained along with my brother who became a well-known lawyer, Walter Black, and was uh, inspired by her and knew. Those were the things that for me and others of my generation made us feel obligated to keep on keeping on regardless to the obstacles. Thank and you, I Dad. take that. You, you understand what I'm trying to say? I do. And I was going to come back to you for a second on where does that resilience come from, do you think? Because you certainly have it too. Where, where did that come from? Where, is it innate? Were you taught it by your family members? Where does it come from? Because I think particularly those who are in law school well, now need a little tutorial on, tutorial on resilience. Young generation in general yeah. needs that tutorial. Well, very early, when I graduated from high school, I'm in high school, I went to work in the insurance business. And I worked for a different company, but the model of success was in Supreme Liberty, which Earl B. Dickerson was the president and they broke the barriers. At that time, it seems incredible, blacks could not get insurance from white companies that were over $500. Earl B. Dickerson and his team created Supreme, which enabled people of color to get the insurance level that they wanted. And that was significant in those days Thank of you, the Great Dad. Depression. Exactly. We were right? not depressed. Exactly. So that's a good segue to it, my mother to spend a minute on the answer to the question about the Hansberry case, but also if you would share a little bit about your dad, who also was a businessman along the same time as Uncle Earl, and also saw a void in terms of both insurance and also in banking in the blank community. That's my puppy making the noise. Um, you know, um, <clears throat> my father followed Uncle Earl to the University of Illinois and the Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity and Supreme Liberty Life. Uh, his first job in Chicago was there and uh, he was involved with housing for the rest of his life. So uh, the uh, breaking of the restricted covenant in the Hyde Park was a, a fact of, of great merit in our house and uh, was celebrated by uh, most of the people who were active civically in the black community at the time. I think that um, we um, felt very strongly that uh, this was a breakthrough for African-Americans and indeed, uh, it wasn't many years later that uh, Uncle Earl and uh, Aunt Kathy moved into that big apartment on Drexel Boulevard that Steve remembers so well. And his grandparents and uncles and aunts moved across the uh, square from them. And so the uh, ability of African-Americans to move on the other side of Cottage Grove was very new for my generation. Uh, that was a direct result of the um, edict from the Supreme Court that it was no longer legal to uh, have restricted covenants. So it was a hugely important event. And certainly my father was very much aware of it. Uh, he also felt the need for some intervention into the mark mortgage market in Chicago and started the Home Loan Bank in Chicago, uh, which then also offered an opportunity for African-Americans to own their own homes. But certainly there was all laid down by Supreme Liberty Life's work and uh, the other insurance companies who became the mortgage banks for the African-American community. So Illinois Service Federal is still up and operating today, which began decades and decades ago by your 
by your father. Um, all right, so Steve Brown, as you listen to this conversation, and you mentioned he was your grandfather, but did you did you have an appreciation in his lifetime of the magnitude of what he accomplished, particularly given the state of affairs in the black community at the time he came of age? Are those stories that your mom and, and your grandfather and Aunt Catherine to talked about? Or did you learn what you know about him? I mean, was he modest or did you read the books or how did you, how did you learn about him? Yes, it's all of the above. I, I have to say, I have been completely educated in new ways by this journey uh, with the UFC and prior to that with the, uh, the book that uh, Marcus Shepard and um, uh, uh, Blakely, Professor Blakely put together. So over these last 20 years, I have learned so much. Uh, it just kind of leaves me uh, amazed again. Uh, as a kid growing up, I had awareness, global, loose, that special things had occurred. I had some names and faces and it was, uh, as probably it was very similar in your house, uh, race, politics, business, all of it was dinner table conversation. I mean, this was not unknown, certainly, uh, but I had no real idea of the mosaic that is Earl Dickerson, the many, many pieces. I had no idea that uh, Catherine was your godmother until very recently. I had no idea that Earl Dickerson was in Washington, D.C. for the March on Washington in 1963, where I had absolute memory of my father going in 1963 to the march. Uh, right. I didn't know that until um, actually very recently, until after the book came out. And I was like, I, I questioned its validity because I had never heard him speak of that or anyone else in the family for that matter. So there have been some just fantastic uh, uh, revelations that the man was a founding member of the VFW. I mean, just stunning, stunning. So quite the mosaic and uh, I feel very, very fortunate to have just a small piece of the legacy. And it got me to meet the Bowmans and so many others, you know, the, it's, been a, it's been a great ride. Yes, it has. So Steve Saltzman, tell us a bit about, if you look back on Earl Dickerson's career, what really stands out to you? We've already talked about the one Supreme Court case, but if you were to try to, to summarize what we would say to the next generation about what he stood for and what he accomplished, how might you summarize it? Brilliant, fearless, courageous, somebody who Again, in Hansberry versus Lee, this, these restrictive covenants were really, really harming black folks' ability to live places. And he took that on and defeated it and started the path that, that, that caused it completely to be defeated in the country. So an incredible accomplishment. As I said earlier, he, he became president of the Lawyers Guild during the height of McCarthyism when the guild was under attack. Who would have done that? Who? And, and let me, a quick story. We got to know Earl in the uh, early 80s, some of us Lawyers Guild folks. And so uh, after we learned he'd been president during that, of the Guild during that time, we asked him, did he pay a price? And he said, he smiled and he said, yes, I did. When Kennedy was elected president, I wanted to be an undersecretary in the Commerce Department. And it came out, I'd been Lawyers Guild president and that was it for that. The same thing happened when after Otto Kerner uh, became governor of Illinois. So uh, we said, how do you feel about that? And he smiled and he said, I'm okay with it. We couldn't let Hoover and them do that to us. One other story, one other thing. In 1980, after Harold Washington was elected mayor and first black mayor of Chicago in early uh, 1983, the guild had a, a National Lawyers Guild convention in Chicago in August of that year. We wanted Harold to be our keynote speaker and he agreed. And we invited Earl B to introduce Harold. 
Earl B's introductory speech should have been entitled, What I Expect You to Do as Mayor. <laughs> Harold sat in utter awe. I mean, I never saw Harold sit in awe uh, or look in awe at anybody. When Harold got up to speak, he said that Earl B had been his political mentor because Earl B had been an independent uh, Democratic alder person in, in, I think, 1939. So uh, that, was, that was pretty, pretty amazing. One other thing, Earl was honored, I think, by the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Oppression in 1986. He gave a speech about the history of racial discrimination in this country that was so sophisticated. The citations were so amazing that I, I frankly just sat there in utter awe at listening to this. What a remarkable guy. Very, very well said. So sometimes I play a bit of a game with myself and I try to imagine what people who are no longer with us would think about current events. And so I remember, um, and Steve, you will remember this, when I was a commissioner of planning and development, one of our tasks was working with the Chicago Housing Authority to tear down many of the old and uh, dilapidated public housing, including the Robert Taylor homes named after my grandfather and build back mixed income housing on site. And I began that work when I was at the city of Chicago and I continued it when I joined the Habitat company that was the receiver for the Chicago Housing Authority at the time. And I used to imagine what my mom's dad would think. He was chairman of the Chicago Housing Authority in the late forties and he resigned in frustration because he could not get the city council to go along with building low density public housing in the white communities that would blend into the urban landscape. And so here we are decades later and his granddaughter who he never knew because he, he died when I was just six months old was responsible for kind of fulfilling his dream, a dream that had seemed impossible at the time and certainly was impossible at the time. And so a question I have for each of you and we'll start with Tim again is Given everything that's going on today, and I don't so much mean this horrific COVID-19 pandemic, although you could speak to that too if you wish, but I'm really thinking more in terms of the racial justice awakening that came to a head last summer in the wake of George Floyd, that we are seeing with a resurgence with um, the trial of the police officer who will remain nameless, who shot and killed George Floyd to the more recent killings of Dante Wright, the airing in Chicago of 13-year-old Adam's video yesterday and his interaction with the police, this movement for social justice, which Earl having observed the 60s, we know what happened in the 60s pales compared to what we saw last summer in all 50 states with people of all ages and backgrounds and races fighting and saying Black Lives Matter and in not being something that was in a small minority where taking a knee was so controversial, but was embraced wholeheartedly. And I'm just curious what you think he would think about all this right now. If he were still alive with us today, Tim, what would he say? Irby would bring the community, particularly the professionals together to deal with this issue. Where did the guns come from and who uses them? And police have the right to have them, but how do they use them? Irby would, with his organized ability, bring together so that, that those questions would have to be answered explicitly against injustice and the use of firearms to carry that injustice further. Mom? Well, I think he'd be just as outraged as he ever was and just as enthusiastically engaged as he ever was. Uh, um, he would not be sitting down on his laurels by any stretch of the imagination, but trying to figure out what do we do next and how do we do it? And 
enjoy may be the wrong word, but he was enthusiastic about his fights. And uh, I, I can't imagine him being uh, blase or uh, disinterested. Uh, he would have been as excited about getting in the fray now as he was a generation ago. Two generations uh, ago. <laughs> two generations ago, exactly. Uh, Steve Sossman? I think on, on the one hand, he would say, this is still going on in this, in this United States of America democracy. And on the other hand, he, I agree with, with my old friend, somebody I greatly admire, Tim Yule, he would have wanted to bring people together. And I think he would have pushed, he would have done it in two ways. He would have pushed doing something that really was gonna make a difference but he would also make sure that people didn't go pushing things that had no chance of success. So he would combine, I think he was somebody who could really say, combine say more those. about Say more about that, because I think that's particularly relevant on, on this issue right here, of the difference between dramatic change and incremental change and the art of the possible versus aspiration. Well, I mean, it depends on the situation. Uh, my my take on the Chicago Police Department is that uh, this is much less of an issue of a training than it's an issue of culture, a culture that's far too rooted in racism. I think one interesting thing is that we there's just been created a new, they don't use the same name, but a new Afro-American police league. Remember Renault Robinson and Howard Saffold and uh, Buzz Palmer who, unfortunately died last Sunday. They really pushed that and they they were they were making changes in the police department. And, and that needs to happen from within, but also from without. And I think Earl would have understood that and, and would have wanted to see both things happening at the same time. Steve Brown? I, I second everything that was said, but I think that one of the things that I came to know as an adult and uh, Valerie, you may have had a similar experience um, with Earl. Uh, his call for the next generation and people that were uh, attorneys in training, law school, that's why the law school has the Earl Dickerson chapter. He would be very adamant of the, con the continuity required to make change that we must all do our part and stay at the wheel. I mean, I think that as an adult, uh, that became maybe the, one of the single greatest life lessons that he gave to me, how we discussed just continuing to work. It's never gonna be perfect. It, we're never ever going to get there. It's a Zeno's paradox. As long as there's a distance left, you can always cut it in half and you just have to keep working and grinding. So that notion of the possible, versus what's practical, he had a great feel for, you gotta be on top of your game to figure out what the right move is in the moment. And uh, he seemed to be pretty masterful at pulling that off and led by example. But I would also say he put out there for the rest of us, a template to follow. I couldn't agree obviously with all of you more. And as you were talking Stevie, I was thinking, you know, I often say, things always, hard things, always seem impossible until you make them inevitable. And I think he did appreciate the power of the voice. And he used his voice fearlessly. And I'm curious about where that fearlessness comes from. And I, I've, I've pushed this a little bit with you all earlier, but I wanna return to it, particularly to Tim and my mom, because your generation was fearless. You were resilient. and. My, I think my mom would probably, well, you know, and I'm not going to speak for her. I'll let her, I'll, I'll let her say it. But the one thing that she often said to me as a child is the impact growing up in the depression had on her. And so I'm curious, both for mom, and we'll start with you, and Tim, what do you think the lessons were that you two learned, and that certainly Earl Dickerson learned, growing up in the middle of World War? recognizing that things that we take for granted, and this is relevant for today with the COVID-19. I still remember 
combing the grocery store, looking for toilet paper early on. But when things were rationed, everything was rationed during that period of time. Tell us the impact that that had on you, both positively and if you think at all negatively. Mom, what do you think? Well, you know, life was hard. <laughs> we expected it to be hard. And I think that uh, it's, uh, I'm delighted that it's not quite as hard as it used to be for some of us. Uh, on the other hand, I do think that um, there needs to be increased recognition among younger people that uh, this is a mess. Uh, we are still fighting battles that should have been won generations ago. Uh, and uh, I'm not tired yet, and I don't think a world would be tired yet, but I do think that uh, we need to say much more clearly than we've said in the past, enough's enough, time's up. <laughs> uh, and I think there is among young people an increased sense that it's time now to, to stop all this foolishness. And uh, it's a world. It's no longer just uh, your city or your state. It now is your country and your country in a world. And we cannot afford this kind of um, racism, classism, uh, exclusion of people for no reason at all. Uh, um, we've got to be much more vigorous in our defense of democracy. And um, I, I really do think that um, your generation, I don't think my generation, maybe Donald Tim's still actively engaged, so maybe our generation has still got some energy left, but we can't rely on us. We have to rely on you and uh, your generation to do something. But it's now time to be much more vigorous and outspoken and the possible I think, you know, we settled too soon, too often. Um, and I hope you won't do that. Well, okay, so I'm gonna come, that's a very good point. So I wanna come back to you because you're still in the classroom teaching graduate school. How do you find this cohort of young people who we are counting on to be the leaders of tomorrow? Because, hey, I'm passing the baton on down too, as just as you all have still active but I have expectations of them. How would you describe their strengths and challenges? Well, I, I certainly think that uh, there's a more liberal streak in, in young people today than there were, has been in the past. On the other hand, uh, I'm not so sure that the hard work that has to be done is there uh, in the, um, the organization, you know, it just doesn't happen because you want it to happen. It happens because you organize for it, you plan for it, it's uh, strategically done, and there's hard work that has to be done. And I, uh, I worry a little that um, there's a lot of hope, but not a lot of hard work. Well, and the point you're making, and I say this to the young people who I have the pleasure of leading now at the Obama Foundation, all of who could be my children practically, is that it's not just hard work for a summer or a week or a day, it is hard work over a sustained period of time. And I, I give them as an example, the Montgomery bus boycotts lasted over a year through a hot summer where people, if they didn't walk, they had to carpool, they sacrificed um, over and over and over again. And I think that spirit is what has been necessary anytime there has been real change. And I think Earl Dickerson understood that, that this is not a quick sprint. This is really not for the faint at heart. This is for those who are resilient and just don't give up. And he had that spirit of not giving up that I find more common among those who have been through adversity such as you and Tim through the depression. Um, people well, who there's have, certain advantages to That's where the history and legacy of Earl B. Dickerson becomes useful in passing that on to younger people so that they can feel a responsibility to say the- more. Say more about that, Tim, please. Pardon? Say a little bit more about what you mean by that. I mean, there's an old man like me 
102, who remembers the inspiration and the model. Not only did Earl B. do it, but he inspired my parents, my relatives to participate in bringing about the equality and, and the, the fairness that life owed to all of us. He was a universalist and inclusive rather than exclusive, believing in the future, but building on the present. And he was a model and that model can be used today. And some of us use it today. They so, are inspired. And so Tim, so Tim, what would you say to the young people who are on this call today about how they stand on his shoulders and, and, and look, they've been through a tough year. They're not school, law school isn't what they thought it was gonna be. Many of them have lost loved ones, no doubt, or been sick themselves. They had no preparation really for this, just as you all probably didn't have preparation for the war when it fell upon us. What lessons from life have you learned that you think would be helpful to them as they chart their course forward? Well, I can track through Earl B. Dickerson and his life, the history of my own family life, the former slaves and sharecroppers who set, whose legacy picked up by Earl B. Dickerson and others like him to show that the change is possible and also to be prepared as he was ac academically and otherwise, but at the same time feel responsible to others. That for me is the legacy of Earl B. Dickerson and those like him of his generation that made a difference in civil rights, civil liberties, economics, and all the things that we need to continue. Steve Saltzman, I'm gonna to come to you in a second because I see you nodding, but building off of what Tim just said, I have to say, I, um, remember when I was first accepted into law school telling Uncle Earl and the twinkle in his eye and the intensity with which he looked at me and challenged me to get in there and learn and do something constructive and positive with that degree because otherwise I was taking up space in school that could have gone to somebody else. I mean, he was a tough love person as well, but it was empowering because he made you feel like, well, you could do anything. And I think that quality we need more of today from our young people who will feel that sense of That's right. empowerment. All right, Steve That's Salzman, I know you're itching to get in. What are, you, what's, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I agree. I don't know that I have anything to add to, what, to all the terrific things that, were, that have just been said. They were, they're really on the money. Uh, I think Earl B. was that person who had not only had learned from the past, but was into pushing for the future, and, and, and he did. But if I may, I'd like to make a, a little presentation. This, this photograph of uh, Earl B. and uh, Paul Robeson was taken again in 1954 at a Guild convention by a lefty labor photographer named Sid Harris. Sid's son, Paul Harris, is a, sent it to me. Paul's a, uh, been a great uh, criminal defense lawyer in the Bay Area and wrote a fabulous book called Black Rage Confronts the Law. He was president of the NLG from 1979 to 80 when I was the treasurer. So we've known each other since then. So with his knowledge, I'm donating this photograph to the University of, Law, University of Chicago Law School chapters of Balsa and the NLG in honor of, of uh, Paul and the three persons associated with the law school who along with Earl B have also been president of the National Lawyers Guild. Longtime professor Malcolm Sharp, 
1964 graduate Bill Goodman and 1967 graduate Doran Weinberg. Thanks for letting Thank me do Thank you, that. Steve. That's terrific. And now, uh, Steve Brown, what do you think your grandfather would have to say to this next generation of young people, particularly those who are in law school and who he, if he were here, would be looking at him the way he looked at me, but in light of, particularly in light of current events, what might be his challenge, do you think, to them? Don't take up space. You know, get out, to your point, he said, if you're going to have this gift, use it, apply it get out there. And I think that the other piece too, uh, I, I think there is a level of creativity. If what you try the first time doesn't work, you got to try something else. And I think both Tim and Barbara spoke to the tenacity of the generation of that generation, their generation. That is something I don't want to say lacking. I mean, I don't know enough to say that, but it certainly uh, was something that others have had, Earl, in the, is part of this conversation that seems pretty, excuse me, pretty extraordinary. But tenacity is something uh, we can all do. You don't need to have a high IQ to be tenacious. You don't need to be uh, the best or the prettiest or whatever to be tenacious. So I think that there's an appreciation uh, that I've come to know in this uh, journey of learning more about Earl of just sticking with it. He happened to be, I think, a freak of nature, just an intellectual. A person like that does not come out of Mississippi in 1907. 1907, that's three years before the migration uh, is pegged for Chicago. Uh, you do not come out of Mississippi, rural Mississippi, as a Black person in 1907 and do what he did. That said, I think what is happening in this day and age would be so evocative and similar that there would be great frustration to Barbara's point that we're still doing this, I can't believe it. And yet the realization of we're still doing this, let's do it, let's stay at it, keep working, uh, never give up. And one, one more point, because we're just about to run out of time and then I have a lightning round for, for you all. How do people who don't have that, Stevie, get it? If you, if you just, you know, after a brief moment think things are hopeless, what advice would you have for them based on the example your grandfather set for you? How do you find that strength within you to be resilient, to be tenacious, to be persistent? I think that's a great question and one I don't have an answer to because the tragedy is that Dickerson's generation, those folks for us, black folks who were working hard, had the skills, didn't get the shot. Uh, I, I think I speak for you, Valerie. Uh, we had a pretty remarkable place that we grew up and pretty unbelievable mentors and a landscape behind us. I don't know how folks who don't have what we have stay tenacious. I don't know how people do that. I my Hat is off to folks who do, because thankfully there are people that do manage to overcome, that manage to keep pushing against all odds. Uh, I don't know how you teach that. Mom, you're the teacher. What's your last word on this? It's, it's the adults. It's, the, it's your generation, Valerie and Stephen, who, uh, who set the example. Uh, it's, get, it's reaching back and pulling forward. Um, those people didn't do it by themselves. Uncle Earl didn't come out of Mississippi all by himself. He came out with a family that was supportive and loved him. And, and uh, Jimmy did a research project once a number of years ago about people who were successful who had come out of the South and matriculated in the um, University of Chicago. And he, the question he asked him, well, how did you come out of Mississippi or Alabama or Georgia and make it in a big university? And they all attributed to their families, to their parents, to their ministers, to the people in their community who reached back and pulled them up, supported them, gave them the kind of um, background. They could do the work. What they needed was the support. And I, I, I just think that we've taken our, we have not taken our mentorship as seriously 
as we need to. And we need to get uh, back and make sure that younger people are getting the hand they need to pull them up. They don't need the the money. They don't need the, well, they do need the money, but that's not the important part. The important part is the human relationships that are established between generations and the ability to learn from one generation to the next. Thank you, Mom. Steve Saltzman, you've been a fighter for the 35 years that I have known you. Where does that fire in your belly come from and what advice do you have for the young people? Well, it came from my growing up in a very white part of Akron, Ohio. And over the years as I was growing up, watching TV and talking to some people, learning what was going on and deciding this just isn't right. We can't, we've got to take this on and we've got to figure out ways to do it. But the one positive thing is, I think we're seeing a lot of young people who, who, who get it, are tenacious, want to learn from the past. We've got a terrific group of young people in uh, the Lawyers Guild in Chicago. Uh, all those demonstrations that happened, the, the guild provided free lawyers to, to a ton of those folks uh, to support them. And when we look, we look at Black Lives Matter, I've gotten to know Alicia Garza a little bit. I mean, they're terrific. Look what they're doing. They're taking things on. They're getting the word out. So we want, we want to encourage us older folks, because I'm certainly older, uh, want to encourage that in all the ways that we can by providing legal defense when we can, by supporting them, by letting them know the portions of history they may not know or stories that they may not know uh, and, and, and how success has happened in the past and how it really needs to happen again. Thank you, Steve. And uh, that's Black. where our religious organizations can be useful. They have the inspiration that can carry younger people particularly forward with the spirituality that the future is in their hands. Be prepared. Be prepared. Well, Tim, that's perfect. And I will say, I think we're living in an era where our, under, where our institutions are suffering reputationally. And what I say to young people is if you don't like the institution, whether it's government, where it's religious institutions, business, civil society, if you're unhappy with the way they are tackling the challenges of the day, guess what? Do something about it. Go in and change those institutions. It's not good enough just to complain from the cheap seats. You have the ability and the power to go in there and make a difference. That's what Tim, Barbara, Steve, and Stevie have done with their lives, standing on the shoulders of the late, great Earl B. Dickerson. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Bye-bye.